Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000-year odyssey. So tell me, Muse, of that plant of many resources which wander far and wide, the ancient plant of food, fuel, fiber, cultivated for millennia. So as we venture through the past 10,000 years, we will explore and discover the plant from which cannabis derives. The many uses of the plant, hemp, cannabis, hashes, hashes in religion, hashes in medicine, hashes in dear old Uncle Sam. And so our odyssey begins. Today, our odyssey is not long ago and far away. It is right now in progress. And it is an area that we don't talk about much, and that is cannabis and medicine. So today, our guest is Cynthia Lee Sinclair, and she is a host here at, uh, where are we? Think Tech, <laughs> Think finding tech. respect in the chaos. Think Tech. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I am so happy you're here today. Thank you, Marcia. I have been wanting to visit with you from the day I met you. <laughs> yes. Let me tell you why we need to have this conversation and many of them like this. Cynthia is living with L uh, lupus, lupus, and Crohn's disease. And Crohn's disease. Can you imagine lupus and Crohn's disease? Now, I have no idea what lupus is or Crohn's disease. So this brave woman is going to tell us all about living with these incredible. Dis is it a disease? It is. It's, it's an dis incurable disease. An incurable even. disease. They call them chronic diseases. Chronic. When they, they don't know what causes them and they don't know how to cure them. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> Let's start at the beginning then. Uh, but now you are living with it. How right. long have you had? I was officially diagnosed with Crohn's disease 30 years ago. But my initial um, diagnosis came when I was 15, and they just said that I had um, spastic colitis, oh is my. what they said it was. Um, I don't think they really understood Crohn's disease at the time. Um, even still, they're learning now as we go kind of thing. Um, but then when I was 30, I was officially diagnosed with Crohn's disease. So what are the symptoms of Crohn's disease? Crohn's disease, you get a lot of cramping in your stomach, you get a lot of diarrhea, bloody diarrhea, uh, you get joint pain. Um, and now it's, it's inflammatory bowel disease, not to be confused with irritable bowel syndrome. There's oh. IBS, which <laughs> causes all sorts of things like that too, right? Which is just irritable bowel, which just gets upset if you don't give it the right food, oh. which is kind of what happens with Crohn's disease too. And then there's inflammatory bowel disease. And you can um, have, there's colitis, there's proctitis or ulcerative colitis, there's ulcerative proctitis, um, and then there's Crohn's disease also. And Crohn's disease is everything from canker sores to hemorrhoids. Um, your entire digestive tract oh. can be affected. So you don't just so get it's like- basically in the digestive It is, in the, in the digestive, digestive tract. tract. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, instead of getting like one ulcer, you'll get a chunk of your stomach or your intestines that will ulcerate. So that whole chunk is, is like ulcered. Oh my. So I've had several um, resections where they go in and they, they take out the diseased part and sew it back together. And lucky for me, you got miles of that stuff, yes. right? <laughs> <laughs> so I got a little bit more, a few more miles left to go. No, actually, I don't have much left to um, go with that. <laughs> um, one time I was so diseased that I, um, I ended up having to have a colostomy, which is where they, they actually um, cut the colon and stop it, and then they make a stoma on the skin, and they have it come out 
so that and then you have a, um, a an appliance. You have a, oh, a pouch right there, and um, you that know, makes life a lot easier. Whoa, oh, my dear! It, it was really hard. That and was. I'm sure it I is. was so lucky that I was able to get it reversed. Um, not everybody can. They give you one chance at having a reversal. And if it doesn't work, then you're stuck with the colostomy for the rest of your life. And mine worked. I was determined yes, to make it work. <laughs> <laughs> and and a lot of it is, you know, what we eat really makes a difference. Oh, it does. And so my children were really young when I was first diagnosed. I did about five or six years where I just, I did what they gave me, which was prednisone and Percocet. Oh, God. And I, I describe it as being a manic zombie because the the... Prednisone and made me like manic, and the Percocet made me a zombie. So I was like and, a manic and zombie. And looking like a chipmunk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You bet. The cortisone is what makes you get into being a chipmunk. So um, I said, there's got to be a better way to live. I went to my doctor, and I said, please, you know. And he said, no, if you don't do what I tell you, then I won't even treat you anymore. And I'm like, okay, then bye. It was nice knowing you. I went out the door. I went to an herbalist and a nutritionist, and I just really started to learn what foods are inflammatory type foods, um, what foods are anti-inflammatory foods. And my, my kids were little when I was first diagnosed. So when you have a child, you introduce one food at a time right. so you understand and know what they're gonna react to. Mm -hmm. Well, so I thought, well, why don't I do that to myself? Right? So I went on a little fasting and then I just introduced one food at a time and it took me a couple years to really get so I knew what worked and what doesn't. Um, and then there's all the herbs that come for you and the chamomile that you can use. Um, capsaicin, but capsaicin is a pepper. Yes. And, and turmeric, which is like the best anti-inflammatory on the planet, I can't use it because it's, unless I can figure That's out a, a way to ingest it. The terpenes. Right, yeah. so the, um, the turmeric I can't take because it just is too, too spicy strong. for yeah. me. It's too strong. I can't figure out a way to make it so that it, it works. So, But I, I started to use all of the, the herbs. And this is, you know, I was still a young hippie at the time, <laughs> right, in California. <laughs> well, and, just... and before they called it medical marijuana, all I knew was when I used it, my stomach stopped hurting. Mm-hmm. Back then, anyway, I don't smoke it anymore. I use it as tea, um, or I, I sometimes use the edibles, but they're kind of strong. I'm not so sure I like those. The CBDs are great. Um, but back in the day, and every once in a while I still will, but um, I could, if I have terrible cramps, so bad I couldn't stand up, I could just take one small hit and it'd be gone. Poof. I wouldn't be nauseous anymore. My stomach wouldn't be cramping anymore. Um, I would be able to eat and it would be okay. And, and so I know that that has really followed me. So I, I smoked it for quite a long time. And then I was a minister in the South and I wasn't about to, you know, um, disrespect my congregations by using it then or do something that would compromise them. So you were a them. Methodist minister? I was. I was a Methodist minister in Alabama for 10 years. Oh, wow. For four so years. Yeah, that, that. Hmm. They wouldn't take any too kindly to your smoking. No. <laughs> no. It's like the last state no, in the no, union no, it'll ever no, be legal. No. I don't even know if they'll ever come around to medical no, use. No, I, no, who knows? No, who right? Knows. Um, but now I live here. Okay, so it's finally legal. I have a, a medical card, all that That's stuff. Right. But I live in a condominium, and I can't, can't smoke, smoke in my condominium, yeah. which is one of the reasons why I use tea, um, which works really well. And I've always used tea. Because with tea, you don't get any of the THC. You just get the CBDs. Mm -hmm. It gets hot enough to release the CBDs, but it doesn't get hot enough to release, you know, the, the THC. THC. Yeah. yeah, so it's like the ultimate cup of chamomile tea, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, talking about a relaxing cup of tea, it really works. Okay, just for anybody that doesn't know, the CBD does not make you high. Right, The THC exactly. is the part of this, the, uh, the psychoactive part yes. that makes you high. Right. Uh, more and more the studies are 
because of the feds not allowing so many studies, but more and more they're I, finding that the CBD is really excellent. Yes. Excellent for uh, so many ailments. So many so things. Many. Arthritis. I mean, think about what it's doing with the kids. Right. With young kids that have um, epilepsy and have all these horrible seizures. And they put one drop of CBD underneath their tongue and they stop shaking. Mm -hmm. um, there's this one gal who against medical advice, against what the law would allow, she gave her child these the CBDs anyway. He stopped having seizures completely. I saw a film just last week, Weed Children is the title of the film, and it showed people that had to go against the, what the doctor said. Right, like this one, yes. right? In order to have their children some of them had cancers, some of them had all kind of things, and nothing, you know, worked until right. they did the, uh, now I don't know if they use THC as well as CBD, I, I don't know, I don't know. I don't think that the film was that. I don't think so, I think it's just the CBDs that but, the parents are using for the kids. But this showed parents all over the country, Yeah. different places with different ailments. Right. And uh, even Canada. And all of these ailments that I, you know, because I have healthy children, so I never dreamed that right. little kids had all of these issues. <gasps> oh, it was right. just awful to see these little kids suffer. Suffering. And, and this helps them. Yes. Right? Yeah. And there's always been a, a real stigma against it ever since what was in the late 60s when that moved, that show Evil Weed or whatever yes. the name of it was that came out. Do you remember that yes. in the 60s? Right? Oh, um, yeah. You know, and then in my family, I came from a fairly conservative family, and so I was a drug addict of course. my whole life growing up, right? Because I, not my whole life, because I didn't smoke until I got a little bit older. But yeah, they would point a finger at me, you're a drug addict. And it's like, no, you know, I'm not. <laughs> but according to them, because it was illegal, you know, great, take all these legal meds that really mess with you. Yes. Make you manic and crazy and, or just a zombie. They just put you out cold, right? Whereas this doesn't. So now at Christmas, I was visiting my sister for Christmas. And now it's California. Yeah. It's legal. For recreational use, even legal. And so lots of people in the family are starting to use it. And I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> so we uh, but I really want uh, want you to talk about uh, lupus. What? Okay. Tell me the difference. Right. What, with Crohn's what? disease, it's all about your intestines, right? And with lupus, it's another inflammatory disease. They're called the autoimmune, MS, lupus, Crohn's disease, um, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis. Um, those are all considered autoimmune, right? And so they're all um, inflammatory. So even the lupus is inflammatory too. I've had a stroke. Um, it first started in my bloodstream. And so I would throw blood clots in my bloodstream. I'd get all these blood clots all over the place. And then that's how I started, had a stroke. I've had three heart attacks, um, I, blood clots from blood clots. And, and this now is because it's of the lupus. From the lupus. And now the lupus has gone from my bloodstream, and now it's systemic lupus. So that's it's attacked my heart and my head and attacks all these other places. And so the cannabis helps with... Helps the inflammatory good. condition. Absolutely. It helps with inflammation. I have really severe arthritis that could be from the prednisone over the years. It could be from... Um, from the lupus or the Crohn's disease itself. Could be from a lot of different things. Uh-huh. Um, well, so... Yes, yeah, so, but you are doing the cannabis. you got a card, so you... Oh, I have a card. Cannabis, so you're doing... I, I do, and I use the CBDs. Um, I don't get as much um, relief from just, like, the CBD drops in my food or something than I do from actually using the flowers to make tea. Uh -huh. And and it doesn't get hot enough, like I said, to release the THC, but it does release the CBDs. And, and you get relief. 
And I'll tell you, after I had um, a colostomy, I went back to smoking weed. I went, wait a minute, okay. <laughs> now I, I stop know what... and I end up with a colostomy. Hmm, maybe I want to go back. back. Yes. And so I started um, smoking <laughs> a little bit and I started drinking the tea again. And sure enough, I was able to, you know, reverse it. Okay, we need to take a break. And when we come back, let's tell us more about you. Okay. Okay, we'll be right back. Here. Aloha and welcome to At the Crossroads. I'm your host, Keisha King. You can catch me every Wednesday, alive at five. I'll see you there. Aloha and mabuhai. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po, mabuhay, and aloha. Aloha, and we're back. And we're talking to my new best friend. But of course, you know, we only talk to best friends. So, <laughs> Cynthia, everybody in Think Tech knows Cynthia. This is, she does respect after Finding the, respect finding in the chaos. Respect in the chaos. Because there's plenty of chaos there's, out well, there. there. There is. And I'm the out water. there trying to find as much respect as I can. Really, specifically, my show is a safe place for survivors of abuse to come and tell their stories and a place for advocates to come and share important resources. And so I am a survivor of domestic violence and child abuse. Um, oh, wow. And I believe that it is my child abuse that led to my Crohn's disease for a bunch of different reasons. Um, one was when I first was diagnosed with my Crohn's, I went to a, a, join a group, a support group of other people that had Crohn's disease. Well, I was so surprised that almost every single person in the group had been abused as a child. Then, a little bit later, right, I, I join a group for survivors of abuse, and almost all of them have some form of autoimmune. Most of them have Crohn's disease. They've all got stomach issues, and I'm thinking, there's got to be a connection here somewhere. And as I started to learn and, and explore what exactly Crohn's disease is. They don't know exactly what causes it. They know that it is an overimmune response coupled with the introduction of some sort of so, bacteria. I would think so, yeah. So if you think about it, the overimmune response would come from, that's gonna, what triggers your immune response is your adrenal axis, right? The fight, flight, or but, fright, yes. or freeze, right? Right. So, um, that being in overdrive because I've been being you're, abused you're, as a child. That's your defense. You're right. Well, I've been the, abused. The body puts up its defenses. Right. Yes. I've been terrorized. I've been abused. So I'm like, I've, I've got all this cortisol and all these, you know, hormones and things and all these chemicals running around inside my body. So that's the overimmune response. And then being sodomized is the introduction of the bacteria. bacteria. And I was sodomized at a very young age. So there you go. There's the introduction bacteria. of the bacteria and so I believe that that is at the base of what um, caused my Crohn's disease because they don't know they say we don't know what causes it they the only thing I say that that they have is that basis of an overimmune response with the introduction of a bacteria now they don't know what causes the overimmune response but I think it came it, it from sound, my abuse. Yes, I would think so. I mean, it sounds like your body putting up a defense. Right. And it I, was, I, I don't know because I'm not a scientist, but well, it just sounds like because the body does try to protect itself. It absolutely does. And, and the adrenal axis is your protection system. That's the part of your right. body and your of, of, of ourselves that is our protection. protection. It's yeah. that fight, flight, or fright, or freeze, thing, right? One of the best books that I've read was um, The Body Bears the Burden. So while, because I didn't remember my abuse as a child until I was 30. 
And funny thing, that's right when my Crohn's disease was diagnosed also, right? Um, but so, you know, we don't always know exactly in our heads, but there's something still yes. in our bodies reacting the body knows. to that yes. specific. Yeah. And of exactly. course, you, you tend to block it out. Absolutely, you do. Yeah. Um, my abuse was very severe. Um, and so because of that, is I especially blocked it out, right? Oh, yeah, of course. And and it's you know, how at first I thought, how could I not remember? How could I not know? And then I think about it, and I would you know was reading and doing a little exploring and investigating. And you know, it's like somebody I read this one thing that says, how are you supposed to go and play two square with the other kids at school if you know what's going to happen to you when you get home at night? Of course. Um, one of the things that my father would do is he would. This take a hammer. Father. Yeah, I was molested by my father. And um, he would take a hammer and break my toes and break my feet. Oh. And if he didn't have a hammer, he'd use a rock. Um, and oh. he would say to me, he wanted me to remember with every step I took what he would do to me if I ever told anybody what he was doing to me at night. Oh, my. And that's just sort of a small piece of the kind of horrific things that he would and there's no way to anybody else could protect you no that's the person who's supposed to well your mom maybe but she was his victim too so sure, of course so she didn't you know she did yeah what could she, she do she was just as much of his victim as as i was oh so, uh, and that's... of course we had the above suspicion right yes um thing that so many abusive parents do they want they don't want anybody to know what's happening so they go to church, they are the perfect family, they run the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts and all the stuff and things. It's above suspicion. They don't want anybody to know. So they took us to church, which was wonderful because I got to meet God when I was really young, right? And so that's where I saw family and that's where I learned how to love and learned what was right and what was wrong. And because you know in your heart and soul you know what's happening is wrong but you don't because you've lived with it your whole life so you don't it's a very complicated issue for a young kid you know and so then here i get to church and i'm like now nah, this is right you, know, <laughs> you, you just know so that's how you became a minister well, that's how i became a christian christian and then, um, then, and then that led to being coming a minister yeah so this was the episcopal church the Methodist, Methodist Church. Church. Methodist yes. Church. Well, I was in a Presbyterian church when I grew up, uh -huh. um, but then I, I joined a Methodist Church um, later on. When I got married, I because I hadn't remembered my abuse yet or anything else, I ended up, you know, getting married to a man who was just as bad as my oh dear as my father. Basically, he fractured my skull, put me in the hospital oh. a couple times. He Wonderful guy, to, huh? Oh, oh yeah. yeah, my dear. You know, and he probably is. He just. Um, there oh, was a okay. lot of abuse in his past that he never dealt with, you know. Yeah. So, so, but I'm saying that to move into being a pastor, a minister, that's quite a, a journey. At 15, I was called to be a minister, the age of 15. And then, and I, don't take me wrong, I don't have anything against um, LGBTQ, but my, my pastor, my assistant pastor, who was a woman, and this is in the 70s, okay, right. so, because I'm old. <laughs> and oh, so, they didn't have women pastors back then. I she was like quite the, you know, yes. unique example. So I just thought she was my hero. And then, and I wanted to be a minister too. And when I got called like that, that day, I went to her and she counseled me and I was going to go to a Christian college and I had it all set up and blah, blah, blah. And as a senior in high school, she came out of the closet as a lesbian. I babysat her kids. I love her husband adored her, her, all of that. And when I, you know, it destroyed her kids. And I'm one of those, I believe, once you're a parent, you don't get to be selfish. You don't get what you want anymore. You have to, until your kids are grown, you've made that commitment. Yes. And so I turned my back on the church and everything else for quite a while. And um, went to Alaska <laughs> instead of going to college, <laughs> which is why I'm in college now at the age yes. of 60. <laughs> but um, so I, uh, 
Like I said, I don't have anything against the LGBTQ community or even against her, but I think she should have waited until her kids yeah. were grown before it happened. Yes, that's, that's quite a journey for the children. Yes, it has yes. been very hard for them. I know they still struggle. Yeah. But, um, but then they, it took me about 25, almost 30 years to come back around to. I was still in church all the time and stuff, but I didn't really get that leading to get into the pulpit and really serve, so, serve people. But now you are a volunteer with, what is the Family order? Promise. Family Promise. Right, my church, our church, we are one of the sponsors for Family Promise. So me and one of my friends from church, we go and um, we spend the night because you have to have a chaperone on site um, every night that it's open. So we go and once a month and spend the night. So now back to, we only have a couple seconds. How are they? They don't know about the cannabis. Um, actually, some of them do, but they're all going to know now. <laughs> they know. <laughs> that's, what I'm, that's where I was going with that. <laughs> like, Which was, you know, and you said you've been wanting me to come on the show yeah. for a while. And I, it's one of the things that I struggled with because, you know, it's like, hmm, I don't want people to think badly. But then I also, you know, God's the one who put it here. It is a 10,000-year-old plant. And, yes. And the side effects are almost nothing compared to the side okay. effects of the medicines they give. Oh, there's nothing like... Now, 1949, if you... Anybody that's watching the cannabis patent, marijuana patent, that says it cures all these things is owned by the United States government. In 1949. They, and then they made that movie called Evil Weed. Well, no. <laughs> that's, that's a different story. We'll talk about that. That's a whole time. different story. Yeah, we'll talk right. about that the next time. But it's been a real pleasure spending this time with you. And F, you will come back. I will. It goes so fast, right? It does. It oh, does. my goodness, goes so fast. And and the, the industry changes so fast, too. Yes. Things are changing so, so fast. fast. People are knowing more and more about, about the benefits of it. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, well... Again, thank you so much for You're coming. Thank we've you been, for having me. We've been asking for a year and a half. <laughs> yes. A year and a half. Every time I see you, okay? When yeah. you come coming on the show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Aloha. Aloha. And we'll see you next time.